Earlier in the morning, Auspicious had gone off with Chicken with the mental fortitude to get his killer foul lizard some kind of armour. The Fork, a leather working shop mostly specialising in animal gear, became the target of Auspicious's aspirations and the family that ran the fork erupted into pandemonium when the skeleton of a velociraptor and a tiny organic woodland fox walked through the door. The skeleton did his best to calm everyone down, but lost a bit of fitting when he told the family of the fork just what he wanted. A little bit of money had to be flashed as a tip, but they eventually got down to business. Chicken, naturally, wanted no part of this, and had to be manhandled by a suspicious in order for the family to get his measurements. When chickens snapped at the air and trilled, many members of the family would take a moment to count their fingers just to make sure nothing was missing. The fox familiar sat with the smaller children and wagged his tail, quite enjoying the tug of war going on in front of him. As chicken whipped his tail around, the males of the family having to struggle with their tape measures, and auspicious having to headlock his velociraptor minion in order to pull random shit chicken would chomp onto out of his mouth. The children pondered aloud, what the skeleton was thinking, buying such a thing, and the little fox made of sticks and leaves would just shrug. Time spent did end up worth it in the end, as the raptor now had some protection against slashing damage. The family taking a moment to enjoy their craft and made leather scales that looked like its feathers of the velociraptor, and even made armour pieces for its tail. Invincible! Chicken crowed into the skeleton's head and whipped its great tail back and forth in order to look at the armour on top. So stupid, the fox muttered, before the children plopped some armour onto it as well, looking akin to leather dog armour worn by warhounds of far away Nulland. The fox familiar didn't mind until he noticed it was covered in embossed hearts and a unicorn. (laughs) It appears that his armour was made by the future craftspeople of his family, and they all giggled. Auspicious walked out of the fork and back into the road, dragging his familiars with him as he went on to shop through the day. First he bought a small lantern he could wear, in order to give the little token of the fire god somewhere to be and be safe from the elements and wind. Second he bought a whole load of standard travelling cloaks from General Weaving Co. While the shops of Terry's Weaving and Catherine's Chop Shop stared on in laughter knowing the company was going to take a large hit due to the king's generosity. Next stop was the butchers, in which he got a whole half of a salted cow, tossing some to chicken as they walked down the road, having the rest delivered to the inn. The last stop for Auspicious was the blacksmith, choosing to go inside the iron well, as passing the kneeling anvil, he saw a drunk skeleton and the dwarf inside, getting smashed on the contents of his tankard. Inside was a taller Nordic type fella, busily whacking away on his rustic square anvil and sweating up a storm. When the bell above the door tinkled, he turned to see Auspicious standing at the door. He waves him in. Auspicious requests a suit of armour, akin to a more standard suit of plate armour, with a slight modification of a door on the front of the chest plate, in order for his fox familiar to have somewhere safe to be. You want me to make a doggy door in your armour? The Nordman questions with a chuckle. Auspicious says yes and they both share a laugh. The Nordman points to a larger set of Viking style plate armour with chainmail and all the bells and whistles and tells Suspicious he can put a little chainmail door in the front with a grill so the fox can even see out if he wants to. Suspicious claps his hands together in excitement then brings up the question of weapons. The skeleton places his battered and skull adorned torch on the counter and asks if he can do a trade or a trade on some coin since he's already getting the armour and some custom work for free. Well, I have to say, you really beat the hell out of this poor torch. It's barely even a weapon, remarks the Nordman, and holds up the still bloody, stinky, fetid torch. I do have something, though, that I make out of boredom in order to practice my filling skills. It's a warhammer, of sorts. The Nordman pulls out a two-handed warhammer, with a skull on top and a spiky blade poking out from the back of its head. Auspicious is over the moon and claps his hands together. Do you believe in fate? The Nordman just laughs. Aye, I think I do. Tell you what, slip some silver my way and I'll give you this hammer and place this monstrosity on my wall. Sound even, friend? The two begin clapping hands, then Furious walks into the same shop. Furious asks about the metal piece fused to his bone, while Auspicious whips his hammer around like a child with a new baseball bat. Oh my! 
They used to do this to pit fighters like a hundred years ago. They used alchemy to marry bone and metal to make them deadlier, despite being unarmed. You're like a walking relic, the Nordman explains, and goes on further saying how he used to see this in old books from time to time. Furious inquires about adding some studs or spikes to the metal, but when finding out how the man was going to drill India's precious calcium, he decided against it and left, with the suspicious still talking about his new smashy stick. Furious Skeleton heads out and decides to put all his chips in the better armour basket and makes his way towards the leather working shop of Gonborough's Leathers, opening the door with the crashing of a door chime that dangles above the door. First thing Furious sees is a younger woman happily working on what looks like some kind of mask and hood type of helmet and waves at the skeleton cheerily. I was hoping another one of you would stop by, how exciting! She cries and sets down her work running over to shake the skeleton's steel-clad hands. Furious has, however, been looking around the room with his jaw open, horrified at just what he has gotten himself into. All along the walls are, as Agile Skeleton found, the accessories and battle gear of those who make war in oil pits and the roiling flesh piles of orgies of God. You, you said there was another one of us that stopped by? Furious stammered out his eyes falling upon a kind of belt with a sword only suitable for one kind of combat mounted on the front. Oh yes, he snapped up my last suit of combat armour. What were you looking for, the same thing? She asks, tilting her head cutely so her raven hair fell down in an attractive way. Well, kind of. I was looking for an armour that's really, uh, slick. Furious casts his eye over to the full body leather suit that had holes where the ass cheeks should be, and make mine hard to hold on to in combat. Oh darling, you know you came to the right place. She breathes out excitedly and takes Furious by the hand, leading him away from the door. I actually have one more suit of armour, but it's special and may just be what you're looking for. The pair round the corner to a back room and she parts black curtains as they walk into it. Furious chatters his jaws anxiously as the back room is just filled with more macabre suits of armour. Assless chaps with wooden studs, dominatrix numbers with magical corsets that can heighten pain, chainmail armour that exposes everything and protects nothing, full body harnesses that also had a bit like a horse. Furious's skull is more or less screeching with horror and panic, thinking he's going to end up as some kind of slave in this place. When, as they were walking, he spies what looks like, well, really shiny leather armour. I made this way back when, but no one is brave enough to wear it. I imbued the leather with the slickness of fine oils, yet protective in case anyone pulled a knife in on one of the, um, establishments, she said with a giggle, and ran her hand down the armour, lined with fine rose silk and chainmail, reinforced studs, and even comes with a face mask. Much like the one your friend asked me to make. However, I will not be modifying this. I want you to wear this into the field and really give it the purpose it hungers for. Furious thinks to himself, Hey, this is actually really cool and normal, as he walks up to the armour. As he gets closer, he sees that the armour has incredibly detailed embossing all over it and wonderful trimming. Oh, whoa, you must have spent a lot of time on this. The last part comes out in a squeak as he sees what the embossments are. Oh yes, it was a passion project and I spent a lot of time. And on she rambles, holding up parts of the armour and pointing things out. Furious can't see it. His sockets are locked in the armour. The woman had embossed sexual acts all over the armour, some even seemingly impossible yet bizarre in their positions. There were also all parties represented. Man on man, girl on girl, man on girl. And what the hell is that? Furious leans in. It's a goose. It's a goddamn embossed goose with a pair of panties in its mouth. Furious tracked around the suit of armour. There were more geese. A goose was holding a dagger in its mouth. Another geese honking. A goose running away with a boot. What in the fuck? Furious breathes out and the woman perks up. Pardon, sir? Uh -huh, nothing, nothing, Furious says and has to admit. The armour is really slick to the touch. She wasn't kidding. The woman presses her fingertips together, teeth glinting wolfishly. So, do you have what it takes to wear such mighty armour? 
Furious drops his head and sighs. Furious walks out, adjusting the shoulder pad on his armour. It's really tricky to get on well, being so slippery, and he eventually gets it where he likes it. Last stop off for the skeleton is, of course, the clockworker. Hop's clockwork machinations. Earlier that morning, he had found the little Nolan woman busy tinkering with her clocks and had convinced her to make a kind of workable magic engineered leg. She had agreed but warned him it would need magic in order to power it properly, such as fire, lightning, something of that nature. When he inquired about other magics, she simply stated the rest were not as safe and thus not much is known about it. The thought had been on his mind all throughout the day and now he stood before the door, looking up at it, wearing his very special armour. She worried him from his first meeting with her. Her accent sounded almost convincing in a way, and she seemed really over-eager to make this clockwork leg for Millie. When he had gone to inquire at the library hall about the same kind of theory, he learned the same things she had told him. They also were shocked he trusted her with the leg. Furious groaned and opened the door, her little chime bell tinkling in an almost sinister manner. Oh, hello, welcome... Oh my god, he's making me do an accent. Oh, hello, welcome back. Miss Hobbit said cheerily, waving at Furious with one of her screwdrivers. On her workbench lay, amongst a mass of clock workings and gears, a very articulate looking leg. The craftsmanship was undeniable, and the leg could be called aesthetic if not artistic in nature. I have been working on this leg all day. Very exciting getting to play after all this time, she mused with a smile and flicked her work visor a piece of headgear with multiple lenses on it to magnify the image in front of her eyes, to continue tinkering with the leg. Furious was, well, pleasantly surprised to be honest. The leg looked rather normal, and he waited for her while she worked. She looked up again with her visor. Oh my, that armour is really something else. What am I doing? <laughs> Fuck's sake. Miss Hobbit giggles, gently holding her screwdriver to her lips as she did. Furious Skeleton kind of holds his hands to his breastplate, as if trying to hide some kind of exposed nether region. Look, it's really good in combat. Oh, I'm sure. Very close hands on hand combat, eh? <laughs> Miss Hobbit giggles some more and Furious rattles angrily. Anyway, come check this little dandy. Miss Hobbit waves him over, and Furious looks down onto the leg thoughtfully noticing little twists and push-type knobs near the knee of the leg. What are these, ma'am? He says, pointing at them. Oh, these are the best part, she says, glowing with a devilish grin, and gives the one just near the kneecap a twist and push. The kneecap flies open with a spring, and a fucking dagger launches out and embeds itself into the wall. Wow, hidden dagger spring trap. What am I doing? She exclaims and looks proudly at Furious. Furious is horrified. You put a spring-loaded knife in her knee? Oh, not only that, there is a flame... A f what the fuck does that say? There is a flammen werfer as well. And points to another actuator near the shin. A what? The skeleton yells, clasping his hands to his face. A flammen werfer? Well... Not exactly flames, but it shoots out energy from the power source in here and points to the little tank inside of the leg where magic is disposed. Okay, well, anything else? Yep, there is a self-destruct device in case she does not want to be taken alive. There is a pause, a long pause. It is this one here. She points at the little safety actuator behind the knee and shows him how to work it. Thank you for your hard work. Oh, no problem. It was very fun to do. Really makes me miss my old null land. What happened? Furious asks darkly. Oh, never you mind. Here, take this and go get that little girl back on two legs. Off you go. Also, she leans in. I know about your necromancer. She may try to power it, it is not exactly, eh, uh, well tested. Anyway, off you go. Furious steps out of the building, holding the leg as if it were a bomb in his hands. Agile will not be happy. 
he thinks, and walks away towards the market district to buy a few more minor things. Where has Grey and Millie been? Grey and Millie have been on an adventure, of course. After breakfast, Agile took her, still holding her in a princess carry, to tour town and buy things with him, as well as buying Millie some new clothes. Millie also gets hungry again, so Agile has to get her some stall food from time to time. They tour the animal auctions, both of them seeing the beasts from far away. They walk along the wall, where the ragged hole was being patched, and both of them stared at it for some time, before Millie remembers that she wanted to see that pocket frigate. Agile agrees, and both of them make the long way back to town towards the wharf. As they are travelling, people nod and some even tip their hat to the two of them while some of the female townspeople even coo and awe over how the skeleton is treating the crippled girl, acting like a butler in a way. Seems like it too, as she makes Agile hold things in his mouth while she tries on some gloves and makes him hold on to your stick infection in his teeth, holding on to the stick with his old chompers. Agile, his mandible speckled with cream sauce and Millie wearing a new pair of doe-skin leather gloves, arrive at the wharf and there is a large crowd. Not shocking, seeing as how there is a mini frigate being held aloft in the air by what looks like an elongated lung, festened with ropes of all sizes and kinds. Whoa! Both of them say aloud, as they gaze up at the Queen Fairy, the name of which displayed at the rear, gold metal letters glittering in the sun. Do you think we can get on it? Millie asks, looking up at Agile as she pokes her two pointer fingers together. Agile Skeleton looks down at her, and tilts his head as most do when they wink. You betcha, we're heroes after all. The Skeleton strides forth with the girl in his arms, and walks with a purpose all the way to the actual loading deck. The Queen Fairy uses a wench and dolly system to lower and raise goods and freight up and down. Since the ship can't fully dock on hard ground without proper berth, and water landings are strictly emergency due to the difference of shipbuilding put into pocket frigates and regular seafaring constructions. The bosun of the Queen Fairy, Betty Pearl, notices that amongst her workers on the loading dock and the movements of barrels, a skeleton holding a girl is standing on her fucking loading dock. Hey, 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 you there! She roars, stomping over and holding up her clipboard. You, yes, you, why the hell are you pointing at yourself? No, don't point at the girl. I'm talking to both of you. Pearl is strapping for a woman, arms covered with nautical tattoos and both of her ears pierced with grand hoops of gold. And her meaty legs made audible thumps as she stumped towards Agile and Millie. What the hell are you doing on my loading dock? We wanted to see the ship, Agile and Millie say at the same time. And Millie points up at the boat. The fucking gall are you, Pearl says quietly when a faint buzzing comes from her pants socket. She fishes out what looks like a small metal orb and holds it up to her ear. She looks shocked, then places the orb near her mouth. Captain, yeah, can't be sure. She's cut off by the orb vibrating and then they almost hear the voice coming from it. But what if they fall off the fucking thing? Pearl whines. I just got the rest of the dock worker from Carbonoy from in between the boards, she says. From in between the boards in a very feminine whine, but still the little orb buzzes and she glares at Agile and Millie. Fine, ride the feckin' thing then, stand there, centre. I bet the little one would throw her innards like an inflated cow. Millie makes a contorted face of indigestion while Agile turns and stands in the middle of the platform, looking around at all the barrels and crates near him. What a rude woman, Millie utters, as the platform shudders and is borne aloft slowly by the ropes and wheels being actuated by the ground crews. Millie sits up as best she can in Agile's arms, as they travel roughly three stories into the air via the little system, and come to a final shudder near the edge of the boat. Experienced workers wearing rope harnesses stop onto the platform to begin offloading supplies, and a rather dainty little woman steps forward and takes Millie's hand, leading her and Agile off the platform and onto the deck. Millie's eyes are the size of saucers, and Agile's skull is swivelling back and forth, his jaw agape. Women dart back and forth amongst the rigging and the gas envelope, checking for leaks and any damage, while others seem to be checking on birds that are trying to make nests in their rope tangles. Uh, Mr. Agile, 
I don't see any men, Millie says, looking back and forth from Agile's arms. That's because there aren't any, little missy. Agile turns around to see the captain, Colleen McBust, standing proudly with a pop to her hips as she collapses a long spyglass between her hands. Captain McBust is well endowed with powerful weaponry. Across her ample chest sits four pairs of gold inlaid flintlock pistols, with a sabre on each side of her hip, which are held in place by a very formidable looking belt and collapsed with a buckle shaped like a mermaid. Millie is quite excited to see the captain and she tells her all about how much she loves her ship. Captain McBust almost seems to swim in the adoration, absorbing it like a plant does sunlight and Agile gives a snort every once in a while, except when he's admiring her pistols. Oh, I wanted to ask, Millie chirps, while Captain McBust gives them a tour of the gun deck. Why are all the crew women? Captain McBust just smiles. Uh, well, we've all been besmirched one way or another by the hairier sex, and we've all banded together a crew of fair, sky-wandering ladies, keeping each other company when men could not. Millie looks a little confused by this. Captain McBust notices and clears her throat a little awkwardly. <clears throat> well, we prefer each other than, uh, men, you see. Makes things easier, no worries of babies and such. Millie gives it a long think, her eyes following a sailor that was also missing a leg and walking around with her own mechanical leg. Captain McBust follows her gaze. Ah yes, we pick those up in Nolan when we can. They are mighty handy when compared to regular old wooden peg legs and the like. Hard to run the rigging when you lack a foot. Millie nods in agreement, and her thigh flexes as she tries to stretch a foot that is no longer there. Anyway, let me show you where we store things. They get a nice tour, meet a lot of the crew, and after a few hours, pop back up into the sunshine on deck. Word has gotten around that Millie was asking questions, and a lot of the crew that is missing legs show up to give her a little bit of a pep talk. They take her out of Agile's arms, and he stands back a bit as they give her a shoulder to lean on, and tell her their stories. It helps Millie a fair bit seeing dependable and strong women with the same problem as her, and Captain McBus stirs on proudly before looking over at Agile. You know, if you and her are looking for travel accommodations, we've always got spare rooms in case of it. And she winks at Agile. Agile looks back cautiously, as Millie giggles in the background as one of the women tells Millie of how she lost her foot from slipping into a box of hatches from a rope. We are still considering different options, Agile manages to say back, and Captain McBus just smiles and shrugs. After all the stories are told and Millie has her fill, Agile gathers her back up into his arms and they step into the loading platform. The crew waves goodbye and wishes Millie good luck, while Captain McBust leans over the rails at them, giving both Millie and Agile a feast for the eyes. Oh god. Millie coughs into your fist as Agile pretends to fiddle with his rifle sling. Let me know about my offer, Skeleton. Would love to have you both back on board. She is an evil thing, it appears as she winks at Agile and blows a kiss to Millie. Agile actually leans to the left with Millie, as if dodging the invisible missile. Captain McBust laughs, as does the crew, as they are lowered down. The ropes creak and groan as the platform is lowered, and after a few feet, Millie pipes up. Mr. Agile, I think I know what kind of women those were. Agile skeleton begins to inwardly sweat. Oh yeah, what were they? Millie leans in towards Agile bringing the back of her hand towards her mouth as if the sailors could read her lips and whispers out a single word. Thespians. Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs>